Good morning. It is Friday, January January the 25th, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America today, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. Once upon a time, the teacher of Moses called upon mankind with a warning. At a certain date, he said all the water in the world, which had not been specifically hoarded, would disappear, especially hoarded, would disappear. It would then be renewed with different water, which would drive men mad. Only one man listened to the meaning of this advice. He collected water and went to a secure place where he stored it and waited for the water to change its character. On the appointed date, the stream stopped running. The wells went dry. The man who had listened, seeing this happening, went to his retreat and drank his preserved water. When he saw from his security the waterfalls again beginning to flow, this man descended among the other sons of men. He found that they were thinking and talking in an entirely different way from before, yet they had no memory of what had happened, nor of having been warned. When he tried to talk to them, he realized that they thought that he was mad, and they showed hostility or compassion, not understanding. At first, he drank none of the new water, but went back to his concealment to draw on his supplies every day. Finally, however, he took to the decision to drink the new water because he could not bear the loneliness of living, behaving, and thinking in a different way from everyone else. He drank the new water and became like the rest. Then he forgot all about his own store of special water, and his fellows began to look upon him as a madman who had miraculously been restored to sanity. And uh, this is the nature of the battle in the United States of America today, not a battle of politics, but a battle of sanity. This is what the uh, socialists in your life, your uh, family, your friends, your co-workers, uh, people that you're going to meet at the soccer field, your people you're going to meet in, the, in line at the grocery store, this is what they want to do. They want to get in your psyche because they know that if they can trick, bully, or intimidate you into thinking like a socialist, then you're going to pretty soon start talking like a socialist, and then you're going to pretty soon be acting like a socialist, and then you're going to be voting like a socialist. Remember, look at Venezuela, not so much for what what's going on now is the warning, but how did it get there? How did Venezuela go from being one of the more uh, brighter, bright lights, bright stars in South America to the basket case that it is today on the verge of a civil war? And that is because the socialists in that country were smart enough to get into people's psyche and get them to vote in um, socialism. And that's basically because they... um, basically did exactly that. They Not basically, they absolutely did that. They voted in um, a despot, a tyrant, uh, not just Maduro, but his predecessor. So, um, and that's where the battle is. It's for you and me. If you and I can have the effect, we can stand our ground, we can thwart the socialists in our midst, then the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's of the world don't matter. They have no power whatsoever. So when I come back, uh, no, I wanted to go on about something else, as a matter of fact. Uh, I was listening to a little bit of uh, Glenn Beck, and he was interviewing um, the uh, former uh, talk show host, and they were talking about Donald Trump and the uh, State of the Union and whether or not Donald Trump won or lost and why Donald Trump decided to stop or not to do his uh, uh, State of the Union speech, because he was going to do one even without, uh, you know, do it somewhere other than the um, the Capitol building, maybe go to the Texas border, and or maybe have a rally or something of that nature, and then decided, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to wait. And so it looked as though he caved in, and they were talking about that, and they said, yes, well, the the idea is that, the that he is looks bad it looks bad for donald trump in the short run but the plan is that in the long run people are just going to remember um how um 
stubborn Nancy Pelosi was. And this can be end up looking bad in the long run for Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. And it sounds to me that like it was probably uh, some Republican advice, uh, Republicans that didn't want uh, Donald Trump to go out and uh, make uh, go ahead and do the uh, State of the Union speech anyways. And so wh- the problem, the thing with which where you're short on the analysis here is that Donald Trump is in this particular position because of a mistake he made a year ago. And he knew he made the mistake after he signed the bill. He signed a continuing resolution and um, to which kept the government in good shape, kept it running until what October, November of this year, until after the election. See, he had all the politicians in Washington over a barrel last year. He could have had anything he wanted. He could have had the wall and and then some. If he had, if, if he had merely vetoed the continuing resol- resolution last year and put us into a... Um, into, uh, ha- and have the um, shutdown last year, he would have won. But because he waited, now he's in a weaker position, a much weaker position, because the the Democrats run the House of Representatives. So um, that's why he's in the situation he's in. That's how the State of the Union address got affected, because uh, basically the idea is they're going to wait until after the shutdown is uh, finished. And uh, it kind of get you're getting into a little tit for tat kind of a situation here. If he'd done what he was supposed to do last year, he wouldn't be in this position this year. Now, having said that, he could still uh, show some uh, power here because, after all, he's president of the United States. He could go ahead and have the uh, the argument, by the way, is that he should not have gone ahead and uh, he shouldn't go ahead and have the State of the Union speech, let's say, at the border because nobody will cover it. That was the the big argument. ABC, NBC, CBS, they won't bother to show up. I I don't believe that because I think anything the president of the United States does, somebody's going to cover it. Somebody's going to be there to um, broadcast it. But it's an easy thing to deal with. Uh, People seem to forget that ABC, CBS, NBC, they have no power. Okay, they don't own the airwaves. Okay, you got to know that they don't own the airwaves. The airwaves belong to the people of the United States of America. ABC, CBS, NBC have a license to use the airwaves. So that puts Donald Trump, because it's the executive branch's responsibility to issue those licenses and to review those licenses and perhaps to revoke those licenses, is put Donald Trump in a very powerful position. He could go ahead as president of the United States, and uh, if none of the news organizations want to cover his um, State of the Union speech, he can simply uh, tell everybody, guess what? We're going to review the licenses of ABC, CBS, and NBC and see about perhaps, um, you know, he doesn't even have to take the license away. He could... um, Find them. You could do fines, that kind of thing. Because and do so legitimately. I don't mean as just as as some kind of a petty power lust kind of situation, but as an issue of right and wrong. CBS, NBC, ABC, they're supposed to be doing things in the public interest, especially as far as news is concerned. They're supposed to do what's in the public's interest. And if they're not going to do that, then why? What's the point of giving them the license? There isn't a point to it. It's wrong then. Then you should either suspend the license, take it away, uh, or, again, issue fines or whatever. Another possibility for Donald Trump, if he really wants to be gutsy about it, is uh, since the, the, the airways belong to the public and it's the federal government's responsibility to monitor and regulate those airwaves, uh, find out what frequencies that, they're, that these um, uh, ABC, CBS, and NBC are using and simply broadcast over whatever it is that they're playing at the time. So if you have, uh, say, ABC's playing doing Jeopardy when he wants to do his uh, State of the Union speech, he just simply interrupts it. He commandeers the airwaves because it is up to the federal government to make the decision um, as to, uh, is to, again, to regulate the airwaves. So he could do that if he wants to be really gutsy about it. 
So, uh, but again, anyways, again, it goes back to the number one rule of power, and that is use the power you already have. And too many times people don't do that. Uh, we as individuals don't. President of the United States sometimes doesn't. And much to the uh, chagrin of uh, each each one of us, or the, in this case, the President of the United States. If he simply uses the power he already possesses, it wouldn't be an issue or a problem. So uh, when I come back, I'm going to be uh, reading from the Ayn Rand lexicon and then um, from the uh, 10 books that uh, screwed up the world, and five that didn't help, and the 10 books that every conservative must read. Thank you very much. So the concept of the day is epistemology. Epistemology is a science devoted to the discovery of the proper, proper methods of acquiring and validating knowledge. Since man is not omniscient or infallible, you have to discover what you can claim as knowledge and how to prove the validity of your conclusions. Does man acquire knowledge by a process of reason or by sudden revelation from a supernatural power? Is reason a faculty that identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses, or is it fed by innate ideas implanted in men's mind before he was born? Is reason competent to perceive reality, or does man possess some other cognitive faculty which is superior to reason? Can man achieve certainty, or is he doomed to perpetual doubt? The extent of your self-confidence and of your success will be different according to which set of answers you accept. Uh, and I would uh, say right there that she, again, she makes an error because she makes it sound as though both sets of answers are correct, but just differing, that the only difference between them is popularity or mere opinion. Not true. One set of answers are the truth. The other set of answers are false. Man is neither, so what she actually, she should have said is, uh, the extent of your self-confidence and of your success will be different according to which, um, to whether or not you are able to recognize the Man is neither, uh, let's see, I did that. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, man is neither infallible nor omniscient. If he were, a discipline such as epistemology, the theory of knowledge, would not be necessary nor possible. His knowledge would be automatic, unquestionable, and total. But such is not man's nature. Man is a being of volitional consciousness beyond the level of percepts, a level inadequate to the cognitive requirements of his survival. Man has to acquire knowledge by his own effort, which he may exercise or not, and by a process of reason, which he may apply correctly or not. Nature gives him no automatic guarantee of his mental efficacy. He is capable of error, of evasion, of psychological distortion. He needs a method of cognition, which he himself has to discover. He must discover how to use his rational faculty, how to validate his conclusions, how to distinguish truth from falsehood, how to set the criteria of what he may accept as knowledge. Two questions are involved in his every conclusion, conviction, decision, choice, or claim. What do I know, and how do I know it? It is the task of epistemology to provide the answer to the how which then enables the special sciences to provide the answers to the what. In the history of philosophy, with some very rare exceptions, epistemological theories have consisted of attempts to escape one or the other of two fundamental questions which cannot be escaped. Men have been taught either that knowledge is impossible, skepticism, or that it is available without effort, mysticism. These two positions appear to be antagonists, but are, in fact, two variants on the same theme, two sides of the same fraudulent coin. The attempt to escape the responsibility of rational cognition and the absolutism of reality, the attempt to assert the primacy of consciousness over existence. So, uh, when I come back, I'm going to be reading from the uh, ten books that screwed up the world and five that uh, didn't help, and we're going to be finishing up on... Uh, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Thank you very much. And so um, when we left this chapter, he was the author was talking about 
and uh, try and draw some examples in, of uh, illustrating the absurdity of the notion that uh, Marx came up with about historical dialecticism, that history and life is basically nothing more than power clashes, constant power clashes uh, between groups. Um, what lesson to draw from all of this? If Marxism proves anything other than that the road to savagery is too often paved with gullibility as well as good intentions, it is the Christian doctrine of sin. To put it another way, if you really want to test whether there is an original and indelible fault that warps the human soul and is impossible to erase without divine intervention, then put power into the hands of those who, rejecting the existence of God as well as sin, wish to bring heaven to earth. We'll examine the first and greatest test with V.I. Lenin a few chapters hence. But first, we must suffer a few more fools in between. And so now we're at chapter six, Utilitarianism, which was uh, created in 1863. Here's a quote from uh, John Stuart Mill. The ultimate end with reference to and for the sake of which all other things are desirable is an existence exempt as far as possible from pain and as rich as possible in enjoyments, unquote. There are more ways to destroy the human race than reducing it to a pile of smoldering corpses, and John Stuart Mill championed one of the most drab, utilitarianism. Even so sympathetic a scholar of Mill as Max Lerner felt compelled to say of utilitarianism that Mill's, quote, little book leaves a trace of dust in the mouth, unquote. For the unsympathetic, utilitarianism leaves considerably more than a trace, perhaps enough to fill one's shoes and socks as well. Yet no one can gainsay the enormous influence that Mill's, quote, little book, unquote, has had. I'm going to skip uh, down a little bit. Uh, he basically, the author goes on now to give a little bit of uh, biographical information about him and uh, explain that uh, John Stuart Mill was an atheist. Now, back to the book. Benthi Bentham, another atheist, Jeremy Bentham, who was the guy that actually invented utilitarianism, um, gave the world the notion that morality didn't need God. It only needed a good ledger to balance out pleasures and pains. Morality was merely a matter of calculating the greatest possible happiness for the greatest possible number. Bentham had the kind of self-confidence possible only in a man wholly unburdened by the nagging intricacies of intellectual, spiritual, and emotional depth and completely lacking in humility. Even John Stuart Mill himself was struck by Bentham's general woodenness of soul and unfitness for philosophy. So, uh, let's see, what else we got? Um, the obvious question, then, is just exactly what utilitarian is is as Mill conceived it. The way to understand Mill's philosophy, paradoxically, is getting a good strong grip on what utilitarianism is not. Imagine that human beings are created by the omniscient, omnipotent, and benevolent divine being as the very pinnacle of the visible world, so much so that human beings somehow bear the creator's image within them. Because they bear this image, they are fundamentally distinct from other kinds of living things. Thus, while they can kill other things, like weeds or groundhogs that invade their gardens or cabinets, and rabbits so they can eat them, they are forbidden by their creator to kill other human beings. Furthermore, as the act of sexual intercourse produces more human beings made in the image of the creator, sexuality is protected by certain restrictions that don't apply to other animals. In fact, there's a short list of commands handed out to human beings as a quick reference guide. The commands are simply meant to protect them from doing what violates their special status as creatures made in the image of the divine being. But this is only another way of saying that the commands lead them to share in the particular kind of happiness that the Creator wished to bestow upon them as creatures made in His image. Sadly, these elevated and extraordinary creatures freely chose to act against the commands meant for their own good, and ever since there has been a kind of crack or fault line in the image and human nature seems mysteriously distorted by the desire for self-destruction. This is exactly what utilitarianism is not. Or to put it another way, as Bentham and Mills were all atheists, they could not reply on such a theistic foundation for morality. They had to invent something to take its place. As Mill himself admits, utilitarianism is not original, but is merely a revival of the ancient philosophy of Epicurus. Epicurus was an atheist convinced that all the world's evils were caused by religion, and therefore religion needed to be swept like rubbish 
off the historical stage. To achieve this, he invented a purely materialist, spirit-proof cosmos, arguing the universe existed from eternity and hence needs no gods to create it, that everything arose from the random banging around of brute matter, Epicurus was the first evolutionist, and that consequently human beings themselves were merely randomly contrived stacks of atoms that would eventually fall apart and blow away, so that not having an immortal immaterial soul, they didn't have to worry about life after death or the vengeance of the divine. Regar uh, regarding morality, Epicurus argued that we don't need divine commands and sanctions. Instead, morality should be based on a very simple principle that we might call the pleasure and pain principle. And it will become clear that Hobbes, like Mill after him, was also an Epicurean. As there are only physical things, there's no other meaning to good and evil than this feels good and that feels bad. That is, Epicurus cut through all moral complexity with a double equation. Good equals pleasure evil equals pain. And I'm going to go ahead and stop right there for the uh, for right now and just say that uh, you can see in, in this these uh, philosophies of Epicurus, John Stuart Mill, that go back uh, thousands of years, uh, what we got going on in this country in terms of the left, always the left, always arguing about feelings and how, how one feels and being very materialist or materialistic in terms of uh, creating values, that it's only those things that we can touch and feel that matter, and that concepts and abstractions and other things that we cannot see or feel don't matter. So when I come back, I'm going to be reading from the 10 books that every conservative must read. And thank you very much. Welcome back. So we're uh, chapter one, and we were uh, dealing with Aristotle and uh, Aristotle and politics. <clears throat> this ambiguity that the best of animals may all too easily become the most savage isn't addressed only to some alleged savage man against the civilized. It is addressed most of all to the civilized man as a warning, for it is precisely in civilization that we find those who, spurning virtue, will use all the developments and advantages of political life and political power for the enjoyment of the most degrading vices. Without attention to virtue, without care for a regime's moral foundation, the most savage men will soon enough rule, and we will be changed from political animals to political beasts. Chapter 2. Orthodoxy. Gilbert Keith Chesterton. The more transcendent transcendental is your patriotism, the more practical are your politics. We now leap from Aristotle in ancient Greece to an Englishman born in the Victorian era, a man who is a novelist, a literary critic, a Christian apologist, a political essayist, an economic theorist, and a newspaper man non-parallel. A man much quoted, but perhaps too infrequently read, Mr. G.K. Chesterton. As we have seen with Aristotle, true conservatism is not about political parties, but what we might be called in high philosophic discourse a particular stance in relationship to being. I would say a particular stance in relationship to change, but conservatism, whatever, uh, wherever it occurs, accepts nature as fundamentally good. There we go, making the presumption for the status quo. And human nature as the fundamental standard of human moral goodness. For Aristotle, the main political question was not whether you are ruled by a king or a congress, but whether the rulers, however few or many there be, rule for the sake of the true human good or merely for their own advantage, for virtue or mere pleasure. The main political question is always a moral question, but the moral question is itself rooted firmly in human nature. That is why the political and moral reasoning of Aristotle culminated in what came to be called the natural law, and why conservatives speak of laws grounded in nature and nature's God. Whoever defends these properly is properly called a conservative. We meet now one of the greatest conservatives who ever lived, a man so keen on defending nature and nature's God that he very rightly called himself a cosmic patriot. And I'm going to go ahead and leave the rest of this for next time. And uh, that brings us to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, uh, thank you for listening and have a great day.